Does anyone want to be free this morning? Anyone? I know I do. And I'm so glad to be able to be with you this morning as we continue our summer sermon series through the book of Galatians and finding freedom in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Our pastor Jeff kicked off this sermon series with a powerful sermon in this room. And if you missed it, I encourage you to go online and give it a listen. But speaking of Pastor Jeff, he did want me to tell you that he is so excited to be back with us next Sunday as he returns from his mini sabbatical this month. And if he's watching Pastor Jeff, we're so excited to have you back here with us too. But I'm delighted to jump in as we're in Galatians chapter three today. If you haven't joined us this summer, I do wanna give you some quick background. So Galatians is a letter that Paul wrote to Gentile believers in Galatia. Gentiles are non-Jews who believed and trusted in Christ. And Paul's got some fighting words in Galatians. He's upset because he heard that these so-called Jewish believers that we nicknamed Judaizers had managed to sneak in and convince these Gentile believers in Galatia that the gospel that Paul preached, that they received and believed in, was incomplete and that they were not fully righteous before God until they were circumcised as any proper Jew would be. But here's the problem. Jesus came and fulfilled the law for us so that we could live in the freedom of a new law of love and liberty in the Holy Spirit. And so Paul won't have it. He's upset because he's passionate about God. He's passionate about God's people. And he's passionate about the gospel that's the power of salvation for all who believe. And so these first two chapters of Galatians, Paul has been giving a recap of what happened and giving a defense of the gospel and honestly giving a defense of himself. As he says, I didn't receive the gospel secondhand. I received it firsthand from Jesus Christ, our Lord, risen. Check it out in Acts 9. That's a great chapter. So Paul has been giving a defense. In chapter 3, his tone changes to a defense of the Holy Spirit. And I'm so excited to jump in there with you today. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. And the reason for that is that Paul asks some really great questions, powerful questions in this passage. And my fear is that the weight of those questions might get lost in the formality of translation. So I really appreciate how the New Living Translation phrases those questions for us so that hopefully we don't just hear Paul asking these questions, that all of us, myself included, hear the very Spirit of God asking those questions of us today. So what do you say we jump in? Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse 1, Paul writes, O oh, foolish Galatians, can you imagine if I greeted you that way this morning? It's meant to be attention grabbing. Paul's been going on for a couple chapters. This is a long letter. So he's like, hey, eyes on me. Listen up, catch this, don't miss it. Who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort. Have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It is because you believe the message you heard about Christ. In the same way, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. The real children of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God. What's more, the scriptures looked forward to this time when God would make the Gentiles right in his sight because of their faith. 
God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, all nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. The title for today's sermon is Freedom from Religion. And before we move any further, I wanna address something, not just for today's sermon, but for this whole series, that in Christ Jesus, it's not just what we've been freed from, but it's what we've been freed to. So in Christ Jesus, we're not only freed from religion, we're freed to relationship. We're not just freed from religious requirements, but we're freed to a relationship of rescue. And honestly, I think we miss this in the church a lot because I think we can look back and thank God for the way he rescued us when he saved us and called us sons and daughters, but we fail to live into an ongoing relationship of rescue with God our savior. You see, Jesus is not just our savior, he's our sustainer. He always wants to rescue us. When I read this Bible from beginning to end, Genesis to Revelation, there's one primary theme that just leaps off the pages to me by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, and it's this. God loves to rescue his people. He loves to rescue his people. So I just want us to know that before we even go further. So Paul starts, oh foolish Galatians, they're listening, why is he calling us fools? And he says, who has cast an evil spell on you? Now, I don't think Paul thought a magician actually cast a spell on them. I don't think he means this in a literal sense because right after that, he says, for the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you'd seen a picture of his death on the cross. I think Paul's saying, hold up. How could you possibly be believing these guys? I was just with you. I preached the gospel to you. It couldn't have been any clearer. It's like you could see the blood, sweat, and teardrops falling off of Christ himself on the cross, like you were right there. How could you believe this? Did somebody cast some sort of spell on you? Verse two, let me ask you this one question. Okay, so this is funny because Paul's obviously actually gonna ask more than one question. Paul's gotten their attention and now he's bringing them in. He's drawing them close. It's getting personal. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. Notice that language of receiving. It's important. Because a relationship with God, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit who lives in us, is not an achievement to attain, but it is a gift of grace to be received by God our Savior. Praise God. Verse 3, how foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? If you were here last week, You heard Han preach a very encouraging message about how Christ has set us free from striving. And I've been thinking ever since, are we seeking perfection or the one who is perfect? Are we seeking perfection or the one who is perfect? Because to seek perfection, that's striving. But to seek the perfect one, Christ Jesus our Lord, That's relationship, that's freedom. So often we get those mixed up, don't we? So Paul's saying, you already started your new lives in the spirit. You've already been set free. Why are you treating the grace of God as meaningless? Why are you trying to earn something that you never could? If we could, Jesus didn't need to die in the first place, but he lived perfectly for us, died painfully for us, and was raised mightily for us so that we might know him forever. You've been set free. Why are you now trying to earn what's already yours in Jesus? Verse four, have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? That Greek word for experienced is used 41 other times in the New Testament, and every time it's associated with suffering. 
And so while modern commentators agree that experience is a very safe translation of the word because it's neutral and it encompasses every kind of possible experience we could have in the Holy Spirit, I appreciate that word suffering that's still in the ESV. Why? Because of 2 Corinthians 12, 9. When Paul's talking about this thorn in his flesh that was just driving him bananas and he asked God three times to remove it and every time what did God say? My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Then LT says, my grace is all you need, for my power works best in weakness. I wish I could fuse those translations together to say, my grace is all you need, for my power is perfected in weakness. Because when we hear that word sufficient, I know what it means in scripture, all sufficient. But in today's culture, it's not that great. If you were staying with me and I said, are you pleased with your accommodations? And you said, they're sufficient, but they'll suffice. It's, it's kind of a cut at me. <laughs> It'll do, it's not that great. But to say my grace is all you need, hold on. That means every single one of my needs is met fully in the grace of Jesus? Absolutely. What's more, I'm a living testimony that not only every single one of our needs, but every single desire, every single longing, every single hope, every single dream, every single ambition is met fully in the grace of Jesus. No wonder Paul's so passionate about it, are we? So the world says practice makes perfect. And God says, my power is perfected in weakness. Why? Because when we're weak, he's strong. Do you know we're never stronger than when we're weak before God because we realize the one who actually is strong and there's something about suffering that helps us see him in clear view. When we go through the hardest times of life, he sticks with us, doesn't he? He never leaves. He shows up for us. He carries us. He sustains us. Do you hear it? And we do too, don't we? When those we love are suffering, we want to rush in so they know they're not alone that we are with them, that we are for them, that we will help them, that we will carry them and care for them. I would argue the only reason we do that is because we're created in the image of God and he did it first. So I appreciate Paul saying, have you experienced all this for nothing? Have you suffered all this for nothing? Surely it wasn't in vain, was it? His power is perfected in weakness. He says, I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It's because you believe the message you heard about Christ. See, so here's a problem. Paul said this question twice. It's very important. I don't think in our culture today, very many of us are holding up the Ten Commandments on a daily basis like a checklist, like a grocery list and saying, check, check, check. I mean, maybe you do, but I think most of us really don't do that, if I'm being honest. But here's what I think we do. Rather than trying to live according to God's law, I think the further we get into this life of faith, the further we get into church, myself included, those of us who serve as leaders in the church, absolutely included, the further we get into this, we think God should live according to our law, don't we? We treat God like a predictable Hallmark movie, we know him, we know what he's gonna do. And so as things come our way, whether we mean to or not, we think we got this. We can move forward, we can stand on our own two feet, we got this. So though we may not admit it, I think a lot of us live as though we've outgrown God. And the moment we outgrow God, is the moment we stop growing. The moment we outgrow God is the moment we stop growing. Because when we forget that he is our strength, we'll never be more weak than that. It's when we come before him, acknowledging our weakness, that his power is perfected in us, and he is strong for us, and it's these places that we continue to grow and grow. Have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it wasn't in vain. Does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It's because you believe the message you heard about Christ. Paul adds in the fact that God is working miracles among us. 
What miracle are you seeing God work before your own eyes today? What miracle are you believing God for today? See, I'm convinced we're never to stop believing God for miracles. Why? Because he is a miracle working God. They're not just in these pages of black and white. They're filled in our lives. Our lives are filled with miracles. And the problem is, I think we don't see the miracles we want to see in our lives because we've ceased asking God for them, to be honest. We've stopped asking God for miracles. We've stopped believing that he's able to do them. And we've lost sight of what miracles even are. That it's a miracle that I'm standing before you today. We are sustained, not just saved, but sustained by the grace of God. Our miraculous God. It's because you believe the message you heard about Christ. That's the gospel. You know, all of us believe, if you believe in Jesus, it's because somebody took the time to tell you about him. And it's grace that you responded in faith. I know this because one of my best friends is a Bible teacher. And at the beginning of last year, in her private school, she got a new student who didn't know a thing about God or the Bible or Jesus, the church. And so she met with that student for an hour every Thursday outside of class, catching him up. Because check this out. God put this student in my friend's class and she has two God-given passions, teenagers and biblical literacy. Watch out. That's no accident. And so we've prayed together for this whole last year that he would come to know Jesus, not just as savior, but as sustainer. And last month she texted me a video of him declaring the new life he'd found in Christ and you better believe I was rejoicing. And when I got to talk to her about the day of his salvation and what went down, Y'all, she's a seminarian. (laughs) She wants to make sure that he knows that he knows that he knows what he's doing. And so she asked him a series of questions, including and not limited to. Do you believe God wants a relationship with you? He answered, yes. She asked, and do you want a relationship with God? He answered, yes. She said, why? And he answered, because of what you just said. She asked, then God wants a relationship with you? And he answered, yes. Now check it out. My friend had told him that on numerous occasions. So he'd heard it before, but he hadn't really heard it till last month. He'd heard it with his ears, but not with his soul. And that's how I know that I know that I know that it's nothing but the grace of God that enables us to hear the good news that God so loved the world, he gave his only son, Jesus, that whoever would believe in him will never have to fear death, but we can live in the freedom and the fullness of the presence of the Lord, live in relationship with God forevermore, here and forever is good news. It's grace that we hear it, grace that we receive it, and grace that we would walk in it, in the newness of life. It's faith. So Paul's about to continue to say in verse 6 in the same way, Abraham believed God. So Paul's now still defending the spirit, but he's giving a scriptural defense. But I don't want you to miss this. What was Paul's first and greatest defense? He asked those Galatian believers, do you remember when they first received the gift of the Holy Spirit? His greatest defense was their personal experience in the spirit of God, and that was enough. Because he was convinced that if he can just get them to remember when they first received the gift of the spirit, when he first made a home within them and set them free in the name of Jesus, that they won't believe these lies anymore, they'll remember. And I'm challenged and encouraged by that because I wonder, do we have that same awareness and assurance of the presence of the spirit of God in our lives today? My fear is we don't. And that's why we choose to identify ourselves by so much less than being sons and daughters of the Most High King. It's grace upon grace. So Paul talks about Abraham, he's a huge deal. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's given a scriptural defense, but I don't think Paul brings up Abraham for the sake of these Gentile believers in Galatia. I think he's bringing it up to respond to the arguments of his opponents. 
those Judaizers, I'm sure they referenced Abraham, who, yes, was circumcised in Genesis 17. But hold up, Genesis 15, when God takes him out and shows him the stars and tell him, count them if you can. That's how many descendants you'll have. Abraham believes God, and God counts him as righteous because of his faith. Two chapters before he's circumcised. So that argument doesn't work. So Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. The real children of Abraham, then, are those who put their faith in God. That word for faith means belief. It means trust. You see, we're okay with having faith in God, and we're okay with believing God, but if I ask you to trust God this morning, it hits a little different, doesn't it? And yet it's the same. Friends, God delights in our faith. And he is working in everything to cultivate our faith. God delights in our faith and he's working in everything to cultivate our faith. You know, we never look more like him than when we're full of faith because he's entirely faithful. And what does it mean to be faithful? Full of faith, trusting God. That's all he asks of us. What does it mean to be righteous, to be in right relationship with him? He's perfect for us. He's always been about relationship. Verse eight, what's more, the scriptures looked forward to this time when God would make the Gentiles right in his sight because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, all nations will be blessed through you. What's more? Man, there's already been so much, but it says the scriptures look forward to this time. And that's not just Galatians 3. That's July 31st, 2022. That's right here, right now, that God would declare the Gentiles. That's the nations. That's you and me today, right in his sight. Why? Because we believe him, because of grace, because we trust him, because we receive him. There's nobody else like him. I don't understand it. And yet I've built my life on it. Did you catch God proclaims the gospel to Abraham in Genesis 12 when he says, Abraham, go to the land I will show you and I will make of you a great nation and through you and your descendants, all the peoples of the world will be blessed. All the families of the world will be blessed through Christ Jesus. So God proclaims the gospel to Abraham in Genesis 12. Jesus proclaims the gospel to Paul in Acts 9. And who are you proclaiming the gospel to today? Because like I said, that's the whole reason we're still breathing if we know him and not already in heaven. Somebody needs to hear the good news from you. What a gift to share it. Verse nine, so all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. What's that blessing? It's relationship. It's relationship. I dare you to find a greater blessing on earth than being in relationship with the God who created it. The God who created us, who knit us together in our mother's womb. The God who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all we could ever ask or imagine according to his power at work within us. That's the Holy Spirit of the living God. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. The God who knows our needs before we do. Even before a word is on our lips, he knows it all together. And yet he loves for us to pour out our hearts before him. Our God who promised to save us and sustain us, to carry us all the days of our lives. That he delights in every detail of our lives and though we stumble we'll never fall because he holds us by the hand he upholds us with his strong right hand who is like our God there's nobody like him he's always been about relationship look at the trinity father son and spirit look in Genesis before sin enters the world and God walks and talks with Adam and Eve in the garden he's always wanted relationship with us look at how he came he sent his own son to live with us suffer and die for us so that we might live with him forever look at the church as we gather this is to be the truest family we're ever part of look at witness as you share the good news with somebody it's through relationship we were made for relationship we've been freed to relationship with God if you look outside the walls of this church you're going to see that our culture craves relationship we always have And we look for it anywhere but God. Friends, you'll be looking your whole life until you find rest 
in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because you were created for relationship with him. Did you notice when I told you about my friend and her student who just got saved last month? It's part of the family. What was it that convinced him? It wasn't an intellectual defense of the gospel. It wasn't a powerful story of how her heart stopped beating on a soccer field and God raised her back to life. What was it? Do you believe God wants a relationship with you? If that's not assurance to me that we are created for relationship, I don't know what is. But this teenage guy responded in faith by grace. And that's what will sustain him. So as I close out, I just want to tell you how I have personally been experiencing the truth that we've talked about today in my own life. So I grew up in McKinney, and there's a couple who grew up with me in youth ministry, Shannon and Austin. And recently, they delivered their twin baby girls at 29 weeks and two days. And I'm thrilled to tell you that now, three weeks later, those baby girls are still breathing and growing. And while I thank God for the gift of modern medicine, we all know that it is nothing but the grace of God that is enabling those baby girls to breathe and grow and live. And that night that they had to deliver those girls, I was amazed and still am seeing the family of God that spans the earth rise up as an army covering this family in prayer. As we believe in our God of miracles, He's worked so many already. I thank him for the miracles he's done. And I ask for so much more. And it's incredible. You know, none of us have met these baby girls, Eleanor Rose and Indy Grace. And yet, we are fighting for them. We love them. We care for them. And they've done nothing to deserve it. My goodness, if we're doing that, how much more does God our Father love us, fight for us, care for us, rescue and sustain us so much more. I see no clearer picture than the life of faith. I see no clearer picture than my own life in Christ Jesus and these baby girls who are dependent upon the grace of God for every single breath. Maybe I realized that when he saved me, but somewhere along the way, I thought I can do this on my own. That's my weakness. Every one of us is desperate for the grace of God for every single breath until he brings us home. And he delights in us living like that. He delights in carrying us and caring for us. He delights in being our all-sufficient. He delights in working miracles among us. He delights in our faith. That's what marks us as his kids. He wants us to believe him for so much more. So much more he wants us to believe in him because here's the thing, when our relationship with God endures even through suffering, we not only trust God more, but we trust him for more, don't we? And he'd have it no other way. And so this morning, my prayer is that you hear that we're not just freed from religion and religious requirements, but we're freed to relationship with God, our Savior. This relationship of rescue, of renewal. Friends, come home. Do you hear him? Be set free. Maybe you've been in the church your whole life, but you've never experienced the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. He's a gift. Stop trying to earn his favor. You've already got it because of the grace of Jesus. You were made for this relationship. You are freed in this relationship. And friends, if you know him, who do you know who's not free today? Who do you know who needs to hear this good news? It's the power of salvation for all who believe. Do you know Jesus? Do you love Jesus? And if you do, 
Won't you trust him? Will you pray with me? God, it's grace upon grace that we can come boldly before your throne this morning to receive mercy when we need it most. And Lord Jesus, we need your mercy. We're desperate for you. I pray if there's anyone in this room, as I'm talking about the freedom of the Spirit of God, they don't know what I'm talking about. God, even in this moment, in the name of Jesus and the power of your spirit, will you give them ears to hear and a heart to respond in faith and belief and trust, knowing maybe I don't understand how this all works because quite frankly, I've been walking with you a long time, Jesus, and I still don't understand it. It seems too good to be true, but that doesn't mean it isn't. So for those in this room who need to be set free for the very first time, God, I ask that they would pray with me even now. God, I admit that I fall short. I admit that I'm tired and I can't do this on my own. I've been trying. And I believe that Jesus, you are Lord. You're the son of God. And you love me. I don't understand it, but I believe it. And I receive it. Will you make a home in me today? Will you set me free in your name today? I want to belong to you forever. I don't want to live this life alone. I don't want to live without hope. I want to hope when there's no reason for hope because that's who you are. That you promise that all who hope in you will not be put to shame. Jesus, I want that. I want you. I want to be in a relationship with you who created me for relationship. Friends, if you just prayed that, welcome to the family of God. And for those of you who are in this room who, you know Jesus. Somewhere along the way, you forgot about his freedom. That frees us to not just do what we want to do, but what we ought to do, which ultimately is what we want to do. God, we want to praise you. We want to honor you. We want to be near you. I just heard a couple of high school girls last service and that's what they wanted me to pray for them as they step into high school, that they would be near you. God, you want nothing less. You wanna draw us near. Lord, your voice is always one that draws us near, not one that casts us aside. So I pray for everyone in this room who has felt far from you, but is already your child. Draw them close, bring them in, set them free, remind them of the power and the presence of the Lord, the Spirit of God who sustains us. God, I pray for every one of us that we leave this room walking in freedom and freely sharing you with those around us. God, we don't know how much time there is until you bring us home. Give us a sense of urgency, but more than urgency, give us a joy that this great joy that we get to share about you with other people. Because as much as we wanna help others, at the end of the day, you're the only one who can help us. You're the only one who can rescue us forever, now and forever. You are our ever-present help in time of need. Lord Jesus, as you rescue us, shine through us. Give us a heart for those around us who have yet to say yes. It's your gift of life and love. <sighs> Awaken us, Spirit of God. Restore in us the joy of our salvation and lead us in your way everlasting for your glory and goodness for our good. Amen. <laughs>